Okay, let's get started. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for making the time to attend this first public information session on Warrant Article 13, the proposed bylaw that would prohibit certain fossil fuel hookups in new construction and major renovations in Arlington. My name is Ann Wright. I'm a member of Mothers Out Front, the Arlington team, and also a member of the steering committee and working group that is working to um, support this, uh, this warrant article. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleagues on the steering committee, Amos Meeks of Sustainable Arlington, the co-chair, and Pat Hansen, uh, a member of Equitable Arlington. You'll hear more from them later. Our goals this evening are to educate everyone about the details of the warrant article and also to generate conversation and feedback on the warrant article. As you'll hear in a few minutes, um, the warrant article language is not set 100% set in stone. We've been working hard on it. We feel good about it. Um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback and ideas from people in different sectors around town. But we do have the opportunity to change the language, so we're eager to get your feedback. Um, we, just, we would like to get it pretty set by the March 9th uh, Board of Selectmen meeting um, because they'll be considering the article then. But we legally have um, until sometime in April until they print up the, the warrant for town meeting in the spring. Um, so we really do um, value all the input we hope you will bring today. Uh, let me first review the agenda uh, so you know how we're going to spend the next two hours. After I finish this welcome, Amos Meeks will review the scope and the fundamentals of our warrant article. Coralie Cooper of the Clean Energy Future Committee in town is going to go over the re need and the reasons um, behind this warrant article and the need for building decarbonization and our warrant article's connection to Arlington's net zero goals um, and plans for the town. Jeremy Koo from Cadmus uh, Group in Boston, will um, he's a, uh, an expert on heat pumps, which are the main energy alternative to go gas and oil. He's going to educate us about heat pumps. Um, then we have a pair of people from the Mass um, Clean Energy Center in Boston, Beverly Craig and Bob Fitzpatrick. They're going to talk to us about finances and affordability of electrification and heat pumps. I will then review elements of our warrant article that address the exemptions, waivers and um, appeals that we've built into the article. And our final presentation will be from Jesse Gray, who is a Brookline Town Meeting member and the main architect of the Brookline Warrant Article um, that passed in November by a vote of 211 to 3, I believe. Um, he's going to talk about how they formulated their article and how they got it passed. So we hope to learn a lot from all these people. Now, um, I imagine that this makes you a little nervous that we have a lot of speakers and that we're going to be talking at you for two hours, but I assure you that's not going to be the case. We're really committed to spending at least an hour in discussion and a Q&A period. So Amos has promised to be a very strict timekeeper and MC for tonight and keep um, our speakers to their um, allotted time. Um, and uh, we hope to move through it efficiently with everyone's cooperation. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. There is water and snacks in the back, snacks provided by Foodlink. Uh, restrooms are on the first floor down either staircase. Um, and finally, I want to ask if people can limit their questions or keep their questions until the question and answer period, unless it's a simple question of definition of something, uh, a term or an acronym um, during the speeches, just so that we can stay on time. So that's my intro. Does anybody have any basic questions about the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Um, 
Let's proceed with Amos reviewing the article. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Amos Meeks. I'm the co-chair of Sustainable Arlington, as well as one of the sort of steering team members for this um, Clean Heat for Arlington group. Um, I'm going to do a sort of quick overview of the bylaw and sort of the um, concretely what we're proposing, um, just so that we all have sort of a common basis. And then I'm going to try to sort of allay some of the common concerns that we've seen up front, but a lot of these things will we'll go into more detail as we go um, through it, and we sort of welcome all sorts of questions during the Q&A session. Um, so the main meat of this bylaw, um, what we are proposing is prohibiting new fossil fuel piping, um, so it's important to notice that this is specifically affecting the piping, in new construction and um, gut rehabilitation, so major rehabilitations that are sort of the level where you're um, gutting the entire house, and it's essentially like new construction. So what this means is that um, existing buildings are entirely unaffected. Um, you know, smaller renovations, kitchen renovations, bathroom renovations, any of those things, there's no effect whatsoever, um, and additions are also entirely unaffected. Um, next. Um, so that's kind of the meat. Uh, we also include a number of sort of uh, common sense and practical um, exemptions. Um, so I think if we, is this the first one or was it? Um, okay, so we, uh, first of all, this only affects things on the customer side of the meter. So this has nothing to do with sort of utilities, nothing in sort of the private right of, private right of way. It's all just um, from the meter and in the house. Um, there is an exemption for backup generators. Um, there is, you know, portable propane appliances, things that are not sort of attached to the house's fossil fuel piping. Those are completely unaffected. Um, and then also all gas cooking appliances are um, sort of exempted. So you can still have fossil fuel piping for um, a gas stove or oven. And um, restaurants, which often rely on gas, um, are sort of exempted for those. Um, in addition, uh, there's an exemption for, you know, work being done to repair or deal with any unsafe piping. Um, their uh, hot water for large buildings is exempted um, just because sort of the, the technology to do that efficiently um, with electricity is not there yet. But there is sort of a clause in there that if the cost of these technologies um, come down and become comparable with gas, um, then they, that will, hot water for large buildings will also sort of fall under the scope of the bylaw. Um, research and medical facilities are exempted. Um, and then finally, because this has to do with the fossil fuel piping, there's no effect on kind of the non-fossil fuel piping related to a heating system. So um, if you need to um, extend an existing heating system, um, you can do anything you want with sort of the water pipes, that sort of things that is not affected by this bylaw. But again, um, this is only this only really affects uh, new construction, in which case you're installing a whole new system anyways, um, or a gut rehabilitation, which in most of the cases, um, you're taking out the old heating system and, and installing a new one. Um, but in the case where you didn't take out the whole he heating system, you could still um, extend and modify the non-fossil fuel piping side of things. Um, okay, so now to quickly kind of cover a few common questions. Um, one of the first things that people often ask uh, when hearing about this is, um, you know, because so much of our electrical grid generation comes from natural gas, um, is there actually a, uh, a benefit in terms of emissions to switching to a heat pump? And the answer is sort of definitively yes. Um, there's a pretty um, significant immediate um, reduction in emissions of um, roughly half plus give or take. Um, but really, the sort of what you'll hear about later, the context for this is we're thinking ahead to the future and we're thinking ahead to our goal of being net zero by 2050. And so um, as the grid as a whole moves towards this net zero goal, um, heat pumps have sort of lower, lower emissions related to them, whereas natural gas and other fossil fuel heating in your home um, doesn't really change and continues to uh, have a fairly high amount of emissions. Um, the next question that a lot of people ask is, you know, does this cost a whole lot? Um, it's, at the end of the day, it really depends on the individual building situation. Um, but 
uh, a study was done for um, MassSave that compared sort of a model natural gas home uh, with a model heat pump home. And what they found is basically the cost difference in terms of insulation is um, less than $1,000. Um, and that's not taking into account sort of current generous incentives and that sort of thing. So in the overall cost of a building for new construction, um, $1,000 is, is not really um, significant. And then in terms of the sort of operating cost, they found the cost difference was um, around uh, $40 um, per month, which um, compared to, so this is for a home that would cost um, over $1 million uh, for new construction. So when compared to the other monthly costs that, that are associated with that in terms of the, the mortgage, um, taxes, et cetera, um, this increased cost is about less than 1% of the total monthly costs. costs. Um, so that's, it's a fairly small impact. Um, and again, that sort of doesn't uh, account for um, various incentives, cheaper to install, um, things like that. Um, then the other two sort of things, um, you might wonder about affordable housing. So what I talked about before, those were costs for you know, new construction in Arlington, relatively large single family home, 3,000 square foot home. Um, people who are you know, buying that are buying like a million, $1.2 million house. Um, for those who maybe can't afford to uh, pay any extra costs associated with this, um, affordable housing is actually already leading the way. Um, and we'll hear more about this from um, Bev and Bob later, but these are two sort of um, example, nearby examples. There's um, one currently being constructed, uh, Finch Cambridge, which has 98 affordable housing units and uses um, entirely um, heat pump heating. And then the O'Shea House in Brookline, um, which is a housing authority property and has 100 units of affordable housing and also uses entirely heat pump heating. And this is, you know, without any of these existing bylaws, this is just already in our current system. It actually just makes sense to um, use this for affordable housing. And then um, at the end of the day, the total impact of this um, is expected to be relatively small. Um, so the planning department did kind of an estimation of what is the total number of buildings that could possibly be impacted, and they found that it was um, about 70 buildings, buildings per year on average. Um, you know, some years that might be higher, some years that might be lower, um, but we're talking sort of roughly um, half a percent of Arlington's total sort of 15,000 building, uh, building stock. Um, but then, uh, one more thing I want to say before we move on to Corley is that even with all of these exemptions, um, if there is uh, kind of anything um, that's an issue, we do, there is built in a waivers and appeals process. So if there's anything that has an undue burden that's not sort of already taken care of, there's a process to, to sort of get that waived. Um, the goal here is really to be very practical and economical and not create an undue burden on anyone. So now, Corley. Thank you, Amos, and thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, as Anne mentioned, I'm gonna provide some context on the need for, to decarbonize buildings. And I'm Coralie Cooper, and I'm a member of the Clean Energy Future Committee, and I'm also a member of Mothers Out Front. So thank you. Um, next slide, please. Um, we hardly need to underscore the, the, the climate crisis, but since it's an important reason for um, the, the need to decarbonize buildings, um, I want to mention that the scientific news about climate change keeps getting more dire. The UN um, Intergovernmental <coughs> Panel on Climate Change, its last couple of studies, um, was a, a bleak read listing acidification of oceans, accelerating sea level rise, increases in global temperature, loss of ice sheets, and other impacts. And the situation is predicted to become even more dire. Um, and just this is a this is a slide from um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration illustrating the point that uh, uh, land temperatures are increasing every year. So the red bar is showing uh, temperatures increasing above the average, and that's projected to continue. Um, if you go to the next slide, so if there's a, 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 a any silver lining here, it's the acknowledgement by governments, individuals, and industry about the need for action. And this was a remarkable uh, article from last week where J.P. Morgan, an economist, J.P. Morgan, um, uh, wrote a memo talking about the fact that um, global warming th poses a threat to the human race, and it was leaked to The Guardian. But just an acknowledgement of, of the need to act, even, even in a company like uh, J.P. Morgan that's a major funder of fossil fuels. Um, so in, in the face of this need 
to act. Towns and cities all over the country and around the world are acting, and Arlington is one of those cities. Arlington um, joined the pledge to meet the Paris targets and to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And this measure that we're talking about tonight is just one in a step of many steps that Arlington has taken over the past 20 years to reduce carbon emissions. Um, they, they've, they've taken action to reduce emissions from electricity. They've, done, they've introduced LED streetlights, improved building insulation and building systems, and taken numerous actions. And so this is one more step in that process. And in the process, they've saved money and they've reduced greenhouse gases and fuel consumption. Now, if we go to the next slide, so why are buildings so important? Well, what we see here is information from the Energy Information Administration showing a breakdown of greenhouse gases for the US, and this is an average. But what we see is buildings represent about 45% of greenhouse gas emissions of total greenhouse gas emissions of the inventory. And if we go to the next slide, we want to look a little bit closer. What, what are those greenhouse gas emissions made up of? Well, we see that uh, space heating is about 45%, and water heating 18, and so on and so forth, cooking about five. But a, a big, the, this space heating, water heating, and some of these other um, sec, these, these slices um, are, you know, represent about 60%, and they're from on-site fossil fuel combustion. So that's what we're trying to reduce here. The measure that we're talking about tonight would significantly reduce emissions from new buildings and major renovation because we would move to electricity for, for those parts of um, the inventory. Another important point is that by moving to electrification, we avoid lock-in of emissions. Every time there's an installation of a fossil fuel combustion source in a building, we're locking in greenhouse gas emissions for 10, maybe 20 years, depending on which system that is. Um, and there's a saying that when you're in a hole, stop digging. And so um, what, what we're doing here is we're, we're preventing the lock-in of future emissions and we're, we're stopping the um, greenhouse gas inventory from, from growing even further. And I want to mention also that uh, natural gas is often portrayed as a, a clean bridge to a low-carbon future, and that's really not the case. Um, for one, the oil and gas industry is emitting at least 25 to 40 percent more than we've suspected. That was shown in a recent study. And then leaks, venting, and blowouts are a major source of methane. And one example is an Ohio facility where they had a large discharge and the emissions were equivalent to the, the total emissions from the oil and gas industry in France, the Netherlands, and Norway combined for a year. And that wasn't even the biggest one in the US. There was a much larger one in California. So um, luckily we have um, uh, an alternative that is clean, cost-effective, and commercially available. And we're gonna hear more about that in a moment. Well, I have one more slide. And I just want to build on what Amos mentioned about um, the electric portion of um, the inventory getting less carbon intensive over time. So what we have here from mass.gov is um, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions per unit of electricity generated over time. And um, so we have a very steep drop. This is 2017. So over the past 10 years, a very steep drop in emissions, and then the, the red dotted line is the projected decrease over time. So an electric system installed today will be cleaner next year, and that can't be said of a fossil fuel system. Um, so to talk more about the um, heat pumps, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Koo, who's an associate at CADMIS, which is an international energy and environmental consulting firm. Jeremy is a member of the Distributed Energy Resources and Strategic Electrification Team at CADMIS. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Koo. Uh, I was invited by, uh, by Ken, Ken Prude with the Town of Arlington and the other members of the uh, committee to give a bit of a primer tonight. I know there's a lot of uh, um, heat pumps as a technology have changed a lot in just, just the last five years. Um, we've really seen a remarkable shift in how uh, homes, technologies, and, and such are now available today. Uh, so um, I was asked to give sort of a, a quick primer on uh, what exactly we're talking about as the alternative uh, to gas in these buildings. Uh, speak a little bit more about, you know, Arlington is not the only town that's considering this and certainly not the only uh, town in the Northeast that is installing heat pumps at a very rapid and quickly accelerating pace. Um, and then also take a little bit of a deeper dive into the actually the cost, cost example that uh, 
I think Amos and I were looking at the same report uh, that we pulled from uh, that was done by NMR last year on incremental costs in new construction. Um, so for folks who are not familiar, a heat pump is really, it, it fundamentally is a technology. I'm not going to go through the, the actual like diagram and the, and the uh, uh, thermodyn thermodynamics behind it, but it's, if, the best way to think about it is it's, you have the same technology in your home already. It's in your refrigerator. What is your refrigerator doing? It's extracting, keeping heat out of a space that's cold and pushing it out into somewhere that's warmer. Um, and another way to think about it is it's an air conditioner that can run in reverse. It's trans transferring heat from the outdoor air into your building and then vice versa when acting, in, when acting in a cooling capacity. I think I animated this, unfortunately. Oh, uh, so um, there are a lot of different heat pumps that are available. Um, just, I think you hit it a couple of times. Um, there are uh, air source heat pumps. I think a lot of the examples that have been mentioned so far our air source heat pumps, there are a couple of examples of residential scale heat pumps that have been installed in Massachusetts in the last few years. Uh, uh, Amos had mentioned uh, variable refrigerant flow, VRF heat pumps, which are um, a, commercial, a commercial scale version of these uh, heat pumps that are available. And they, there's are a variety of options that are available that can uh, work in any sort of uh, building configuration. Uh, ground source uh, or geothermal heat pumps are another option that are available, uh, taking advantage of the fact that in a lot of new construction, uh, there's a lot more space to work with, uh, fewer existing obstacles, and being able to plan around uh, using the ground as a, more, as a very efficient and constant uh, source of heat and uh, for, for both heating and for cooling in the summer. Uh, is, a, is an even more efficient way of heating and cooling a building. Uh, water heaters are the third uh, example of heat pumps that have been uh, uh, brought up here. Um, in this case, since the uh, proposed article excludes larger buildings, this is primarily an appliance that is going to be working in smaller residential capacities, uh, but it's effectively taking the components of a heat pump and putting it on top of an existing water heater and, it's a, and otherwise Fits in, fits in a basement like any other, uh, any other um, storage water heater. Um, there are a few common misconceptions, I think, about electric heat. I think um, when you think about both heat pumps and about heating with electricity, um, you know, electric, electric resistance heating is inherently not very efficient and very expensive to heat with. Um, you know, the electric grid is somewhere between 30 to 40 percent efficient, and so even though you know, that, and that's what drives electric heat to be particularly expensive. Um, what's being, you know, in, in limiting the use of fossil fuels in new construction, the push is towards heat pumps, which are transferring heat and using, using electricity to transfer heat from one space to another, not to actually create heat. So whereas an electric resistance baseboard or space heater is what we would call 100% efficient, have a coefficient of performance of one, air source heat pumps throughout the year will range from about 220 to 350 or more uh, percent efficient, and ground source heat pumps th from 350 percent efficient and up. So not only is that does that result in, a, you know, it's, a lot of folks will say that, um, Burning gas at the power plant level means that using electricity is actually less efficient than burning gas at home. When you take those efficiencies into account, it's actually a more efficient use of the gas being burned at the power plant level than being burned on site at your, in your home. Um, so another, another one, uh, misconception, uh, which is uh, the one that uh, my mother said when I told her I started working on heat pumps over five years ago, uh, is that heat pumps don't work in the Northeast. Um, the, you know, in, and conventionally this has been, this has been true. Heat pumps are uh, a very common uh, heating and cooling technology being used in the South and the Mid-Atlantic right now. There's, I think, I think 20, I think it was 28 million homes that use heat pumps across the South right now, primarily as air conditioning and a bit of heating given their climate. Uh, heat pumps historically have not been effective at performing, well, air source heat pumps at least, have been ineffective at performing at temperatures below 30 or 40 Fahrenheit. Um, NEEP, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, uh, administers a uh, certification program for heat pumps uh, to be cold climate, uh, which means that they have to maintain, air source heat pumps have to maintain uh, efficiencies of, of at least 175% at five degrees, of which um, all but about 30 to 40 hours per year in a typical year in Arlington are above. And, you know, like it or not, it's, uh, that, that may shrink more and more from year to year. Uh, so NEEP, NEEP certifies a lot of cold climate heat pumps, and those have been primarily the models that have been installed in Massachusetts to date. 
Um, and, uh, you know, one of the other points is that, you know, it's, okay, it's great that you're talking, you know, heat pumps are, are, are more efficient, but they're probably not ideal for serving as the only source of heat in a home. Uh, in 2017, which is only f about four years after cold climate heat pumps became a thing uh, in the Northeast, in Massachusetts, 10% of new homes were already using heat pumps as their only source of heating and cooling. That number has only increased since then. Um, we, you know, not to, t to discount ground source heat pumps as well, which have been installed for, for, for decades uh, across the U.S. Uh, these systems are intended to be the sole source of heating and cooling and take advantage of the more consistent heat in the ground to maintain efficiency and their heating output throughout the year, even when, you know, when, it's in, when it's in negative digits. There was a great study that was done about five years ago about ground source heat pumps in Alaska, so they're very much usable here. Um, and then in the HeatSmart Heat Smart Mass program, of which uh, Arlington recently participated in and was, uh, to date, the most uh, successful campaign of any of the 30-something heat, heat Smart campaigns I've supported across the Northeast, uh, dozens, of, uh, dozens of homes uh, opted to retrofit existing buildings with heat pumps with no backup system being used. We can definitely do this in new construction, uh, and, even if, and it's still even possible in retrofits. Um, one other, another data point is that um, this is not something, you know, heat, while, you know, general awareness of heat pumps is relatively low, what we've seen since the state clean energy center began rebating these systems in December of 2014 is that the, is that the number of heat pumps installed have been accelerating from year to year. Between December 2014 and March 2019 when the program ended, over 20,000 cold climate heat pumps were installed, uh, were rebated through the program, and that growth trajectory even came with them reducing the, the rebate twice over, the, over, that, over that time to make the, make the, uh, the budget last longer. So um, they are continuing to accelerate now with even more incentives available through MassSave. Um, Mass is not alone. Uh, Maine was actually one of the first states to begin incentivizing cold climate heat pumps uh, um, starting in 2012. Uh, since then, they've incentivized over 30,000 systems, and the governor recently set a target to increase, uh, increase that even more. Uh, similarly, Vermont, I'm missing about two years of data since it wasn't in their annual reports, but they've also uh, continued to accelerate in Vermont. And New York uh, also similarly has set, set a lot of targets and in two years has rebated over 11,000 uh, heat pump projects. So it's very much a reality in the Northeast um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, it's the time. The timing is, in a lot of ways, right for for the market to have met a lot of the maturity that's needed to be able to uh, drive more successful installations. Um, you know, I wanted to just take a quick look at that, you know, and certainly, if you wanted, you know, want to dig out that study, look at it a little bit more. It's called the you know mini split uh, incremental cost uh, baseline study. Uh, it was done in twenty uh, late twenty eighteen, I believe. Um, it compared. Uh, what would be the installation of a traditional gas furnace and central AC and a tankless, tankless uh, gas water heater with a mini split air source heat pump and a heat pump water heater uh, in, a new, in new construction in a home that, that's built, built to code. So uh, the installed cost, again, before any incentives that are available, was about $700 in difference out of, you know, I think as Amos was saying, this for this home it would be about $1.2 million uh, in construction costs. Um, I don't even know if that inc ex included uh, avoided cost of the gas connection uh, if you were to eliminate gas entirely, which would be another few thousand dollars that would be removed from that. As far as annual operating costs, uh, I think as Amos said, it's about $40 a month over the course of the year, higher for uh, the heat pump, and that's just a reflection of uh, gas prices being uh, particularly low and electric costs being particularly high. Uh, but in new construction, there's also uh, both at a, a push at the state code level and also um, in terms of ease of ease and cost uh, to put rooftop solar on new buildings. And if you were to power all that equipment with solar PV, uh, it would cost, you know, and this is assuming you don't own the system, somebody else owns it and you're just paying for the electricity from it, it would actually result in a net, sa in a savings of $150 a year, no extra in increased cost to do so. So there, there are a lot of, I think there's a lot of opportunity here, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, given the, you know, and I think the exemptions that are written into the law, uh, the, the, the uh, proposed article uh, cover some of the variations here. As you get into larger buildings, there's different different needs with those buildings, particularly with research facilities and you know larger uh, hot water uses. And so the you know those are 
exempted from this bylaw, but certainly um, I was also looking at the Arlington Assessor data uh, over the last five years. I think about 80% of the buildings were either townhouses or single family homes, so that, that essentially covers the majority of the new construction that will be happening in the near future. Um, and so happy to answer questions uh, at the end of the period. Hi, my name is Patrick Hanlon. I'm one of the members of the steering committee and represent in Equitable Arlington, uh, which is, among other things, uh, a group of people who are interested in housing advocacy. And that makes me particularly appropriate to introduce the next, uh, the next speakers. And I've been told to, to limit it to three sentences, which I will. The first is Beverly Craig and Bob Fitzpatrick, and I'll let you figure out which is which are on staff at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Bev is Senior Program Manager, Low and Moderate Income Programs, and Bob is Director of Government Affairs. They will address the finances of heat pumps in more detail. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, actually, Jeremy did a great job and covered an awful lot of the stuff that we would normally say, so that's fantastic. Um, well, exa exactly, in, 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 including uh, covering our own, our programs for us. So, you know, uh, we do appreciate that. Um, we are so. I should just tell you who we are: Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Uh, we are a quasi-government agency uh, funded by a, little, uh, a small surcharge on your retail electric bills, and we use that to run a bunch of programs to encourage clean energy, energy efficiency. Uh, startup technologies, et cetera. Wanted to, uh, to say one thing at the outset, that as a government agency, we don't really kind of comment on legislation or things like that, so, uh, but we do certainly encourage the use of all sorts of clean technologies. Air shore heat pumps are fantastic. Uh, and, and I want to give you a little just overview of where we've been through this, and, and again, I think Jeremy kind of touched on some of this, but um, we started the ground source heat pump pilot uh, with the uh, Department of Energy Resources, our sister agency, um, back in 2013. Uh, and then um, we uh, committed, uh, what was that, $48 million to uh, our five-year clean heating program. And, uh, and again, you saw that, that uptake uh, over those years. Um, 2019, we'll skip ahead. Uh, well, we did the Heat Smart, as, 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 and you all participated in that, which was fantastic. And then in 2019, we started the whole home heat pump uh, challenge. So, uh, what we've been trying to do uh, with all of our programming is just sort of push the envelope, right? And to uh, drive this uh, adoption of what is relatively new technology, that cold climate air source heat pump. And now uh, we have, through that, through our efforts, we've gotten uh, Mass Safe to pick that up, and that's why you know you have this sort of widespread, uh, statewide uh, rebates available uh, through Mass Safe. Uh, then, for uh, for more details, sort of on the technologies and how that affects uh, pr cost, I'm going to just turn it over to Bev. So, Jeremy actually covered. So Jeremy covered a lot of this. I just I want to emphasize again, like one of these myths is that it's it's not going to work in our climate. Totally not true. Alaska, northern Canada, uh, all kinds. Maine. Can you hear me now? Okay. So they they definitely work. No question about it. Um, when we start talking about affordable housing, it's usually multifamily. And when you start looking at first costs, it's even less dramatic of a difference in multifamily. So you're usually in a multifamily building going to cost out about five different heating system options. And at this point, you also need to add cooling. So heat pumps, because they heat and cool, you're not talking about two different systems, you're talking about a combined one. So when you price it out for multifamily new construction, you're usually finding heat pumps in one of the lower two of the five options. Um, so that's first costs, very reasonable. 
And we're seeing like a huge movement. And it's really only the last two years or so, everything multifamily is going all heat pumps. It's just not even a push to talk to developers about it. They, they go for it very easily. Um, in terms of operating costs, again, when you compare it to a single family home, um, Stretch code communities, when you build a new construction multifamily, so it's, it's a better envelope, less outside surface area, right? And so it's actually more efficient to be multifamily than single family. Um, and when you have that good envelope, uh, the difference between the electric and gas on the heating is very low, and often multifamily buildings are cooling dominated. So you actually end up cooling, the, the capacity of the system is determined by the cooling and you end up using cooling a decent amount more. So cooling with heat pumps is much more efficient than a central air AC. So when you balance the heating and cooling, it tends to be even just in a stretch code building, um, gonna be about the same. Next slide. Um, so I think you guys already have in the warrant article an exemption for central hot water. And that's really important because heat pump water heaters are great for single family homes and maybe up to about eight units or so, um, that would be fine. But once you get past that, you're gonna wanna go to a central system in almost all cases. I mean, you could do electric resistance, individual tanks for every one, but uh, heat pump water heater technology is not really here yet. It's in Europe, it's in Japan, but it's not really here yet. Um, so I do think having, uh, you know, a provision, I, it sounds like you're going to think about that in the future too, because that may change in the future. Um, the other one thing, we talked in Brookline as well, and I guess um, uh, our agency has sponsored quite a, a bunch of um, passive house affordable housing uh, grants. And so the Finch project that was mentioned is the first one that's being built. Um, but in that process, we've been learning sort of about when you do not have gas in it, what other challenges are there? And I would say the one thing that uh, we didn't mention in Brookline, but I think can be an issue is heat recovery ventilation. If you don't have any ability to have gas, it may be a decent amount more expensive. Um, so heat recovery ventilation, so the warm air in here, when you exhaust it, instead of just wasting that heat, you should put a heat exchanger in and you capture 80 to 90% of that heat and preheat the fresh air coming in, right? And then the heating system doesn't have to work very hard. So that's passive house or very high uh, performance buildings in general are gonna use that technology a lot. And again, if you go all electric, it could be a little bit more expensive. So um, next slide. So, it's not, we definitely should be thinking about affordability, and I, I'm really glad you guys came and asked us to come speak about affordability. So uh, energy uh, burden for different people of different incomes is really an important issue. So um, most people in Massachusetts spend less than one week of their annual budget on energy costs. Uh, when you get to somebody more middle income, so say a, a one uh, earner family as a teacher, it might be more like two weeks of their annual budget. When you get to someone below 60% of state median income, it's often a month or even two months. And so that's why affordable housing, or one of the reasons that affordable housing has been on the leading edge of green building, because they're mission driven, they wanna make sure that the energy costs are very low for their tenants, and when they're an owner, they wanna be able to provide more services instead of spending it on energy. Um, next slide. But what we're finding is in new construction, it's really going all electric is not really an additional cost. Like I mentioned before, especially when you calculate the cooling in as well, um, you're talking about sort of a net wash on a new construction building. So as long as the bar for um, uh, requiring or not allowing any gas is a, a, a gut rehab that's a very high level gut rehab where you're gonna be triggering energy code and you're gonna to have to do a lot of envelope improvements, you really shouldn't see a big increase in costs. Um, so I will say, Brookline I think put some kind of exemption in. Um, their housing authority actually was going all electric on a number of their buildings and was not worried about it. But I, there could be examples, I guess, of masonry brick buildings where it's, it's tough to do a lot of uh, envelope improvements. So that might be the one place where your costs might be slightly higher um, if you uh, don't have some kind of appeals process for, for specific ones. Next slide. That's it. So uh, 
Um, I will say um, affordable housing these days is incentivized quite uh, quite a bit for new construction to go to passive house levels. So passive house is basically the most energy efficient standard in the world. It's, it ends up for a multifamily building being about 40% more efficient than what you would standard build. Um, it uses this heat recovery. It, it, rec it has a lot more uh, ventilation, so it's actually more healthy for uh, tenants. Um, but we're also seeing like those projects that would go for low-income housing tax credits, they would get more... Um, more points in getting chosen between different projects if they come in with a passive project. So between mass save incentives, which every multifamily in the state should look at, and, and uh, those benefits to, to being more likely to get your tax credits, you're gonna see a lot of affordable housing going passive. And in that case, they're gonna be all electric anyway. All eight of the grants that we provided to passive house projects, they all went with heat pump uh, heating and cooling technology. Thanks so much, Bev and Bob. Uh, I'm just going to, I was going to review the exemptions, but I think we've talked about them enough. I don't really need to do that. So I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so built into the warrant article is an appeal and waiver process. So if there's anything we didn't anticipate, or as Amos said, if there's a project that comes up with unanticipated high costs, um, a homeowner or contractor can request a waiver. Uh, we wrote it in so that appeals would go right to the Zoning Board of Appeals, just as any appeal would, would do. Waivers would be granted by our building inspector, who would rely as necessary on other expert staff within the town staff, like Department of Planning and Community Development or Inspectional Services, um, or possibly on outside experts in uh, building or energy. Uh, the decision could be based on submission of conceptual plans and financial details that would all be looked at. Um, and, and the building inspector would give consideration. And we want to emphasize, too, around affordability, that special consideration would be given to Arlington Housing Authority. We have a strong value placed on affordable housing. We want to make sure to preserve as much affordable housing as possible and build more affordable housing in Arlington. Um, and AHA, A, AHA often has limited sources of capital, so... Um, we felt that was important, so we wrote that in. Um, so I guess I can save a little time. Did I miss, did I leave anything out around appeals and waivers? Great. Uh, so you can ask more questions about that, but that's a summary of, of that element. Um, now I want to introduce our last speaker, uh, Jesse Gray. Jesse, you here, there you are. Um, Jesse, as I said before, is a town meeting member in Brookline. He's the principal architect of their warrant article, which passed in November. And he is also um, an associate professor of genetics on leave from the Harvard Medical School. So welcome, Jesse. Thanks for, so much for coming. All right, let me see here. Okay. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to be here, and I'm impressed at how well organized this session is, and how many experts are here, and what great information there is. Um, I, I came to speak about our experience in Brookline, uh, passing a prohibition on new gas infrastructure, um, just in case some of our experience might be relevant here. And I want to be clear that my remarks pertain only to Brookline's experience, and they are not intended in any way to presage, prejudge, or advise on the specifics of what you should do here in Arlington. Um, but what we learned in Brookline is that um, this is an idea that to many seems very controversial at first. Um, but it's an idea that once people get used to, they realize it's actually just practical and necessary, non-controversial. Um, and we learned that through the political process itself, and that's what I want to tell you about tonight. So what's the evidence that this is really uh, non-controversial once it's understood. Um, how can I claim that? The evidence is, is the vote in town meeting in Brookline, which was 211 to 3. Now that vote can easily be misread. It can be dismissed as Brookline town meeting being a bunch of environmental activists who don't care about anything else. 
Uh, but those of you who've, under, who've been to Brookline uh, and met Brookline town meeting members would know that that's not the case. Um, actually, the 211 votes included people who care deeply about lots of other issues, people who care deeply and primarily about um, the, the financial health of the town, people who care deeply and primarily about affordable housing, people who care uh, deeply about many other issues. And so these people had to be convinced that this policy would not harm their primary and, and heart, heartfelt interests. Um, and they were not pushovers, and they were not convinced at the beginning when we started. Um, in fact, most or many of um, these people at the beginning, town meeting members and community leaders, uh, the political elite of Brookline, most or many said, you're moving too fast, you haven't given us enough time. You have to wait for the next town meeting or the next year or the next couple of years. We're not ready for this. You have to slow down. But by the end, actually, they've, they've, these same people voted in favor. Um, they didn't make us wait two or three more years. In fact, one of them contributed to our legal fund, uh, someone who was um, staunchly opposed at the beginning. And another is now leading our efforts to build our first all-electric school in Brookline. So we learned through this process that by engaging in an intensive political process in which we talked through the issues that were raised, in which we researched the answers to the, to the questions and concerns that were raised in our community, we learned that once this policy was understood and once it included um, reasonable safeguards, uh, such as the ones that you've heard about tonight, the policy turned out to be non-controversial. So it seemed very controversial at first, but it turned out not to be. Now, how can something be controversial at first, but ultimately non-controversial? How does that happen? Well, the way that happens is that each person who starts out thinking that it's controversial, who's a little bit shocked and a little bit surprised, has to take a journey on which they discover um, the facts. And uh, in this particular case, the people who went on that journey and discovered the facts uh, came to the conclusion that the policy made a lot of sense and was non-controversial. And so what were the sticking points that would have prevented us from getting the 211 votes? What were those concerns that were originally raised um, that if we hadn't been able to address, uh, we might not have passed uh, Warren Article 21 in Brookline? I'll just briefly walk through what those sticking points were. And they were, um, you know, to the point that this is a well-organized, uh, well-put-together session, a lot of those concerns have actually already been addressed here tonight. But the question of whether heat pumps work, we decided in Brookline that they do. Um, would this increase the cost of construction? We decided in Brookline that sometimes this would save costs on construction and that on the net it would not increase costs. We decided also, although we're very concerned about development in Brookline, that there's no reason that this should slow development in Brookline. Um, we decided also, we asked, would this burden homeowners doing renovations? And we decided no, um, it's targeted to be triggered um, by situations in which it's practical and cost effective to, uh, to go electric. Um, does it really reduce emissions? As you heard tonight, um, it absolutely reduces emissions. Is it necessary? Absolutely necessary. We decided in Brookline we could not meet our climate goals without this policy, even though it's just a first step and so much more needs to be done. Um, can we do it in a way that pr protects against unforeseen problems? We in Brookline decided we could with a, with a waivers and appeal process. And then we had some concerns about visual or noise pollution. Um, our Preservation Commission ha discussed this in, in detail. And um, we decided that no, you know, no more noise or visual pollution than, than the air conditioning units that are already being installed. Um, we decided there were necessary exemptions and we decided that there were some exemptions that maybe weren't necessary, but that we wanted to build a big tent because this is just one step and there are many more steps that we need to take and having a big tent of people who can agree on moving forward is um, a way to take those future steps. So I've ticked these off really quickly, but I can tell you, um, as someone who knows the political community in Brookline, that if we hadn't had factual, um, convincing answers to these questions, uh, we would not have gotten the 211 votes uh, that we got because Brookline Town Meeting um, is not a bunch of pushovers. And that is how we found out that in fact, this policy is not controversial. Um, it's just practical and it's just necessary. Thanks. All right.
Thank you very much, Jesse, and thank you very much, um, everyone else who came. So the rest of this time now is just for question and answers. Um, we have all of the people who you just saw speak um, and more, including Ken Pruitt, the town energy manager, here to um, answer questions. So um, we're just going to do this by raising hands and trying to get through um, as much as we can. And, you know, it is a fairly large room, so try to make sure to speak up. And we're going to try to make sure to um, repeat the question into the microphone. So, yes. So I think, just to repeat the question, first of all, um, the question was, uh, we heard two conflicting pieces of information, one that without envelope um, improvements, the, build, the, the cost is higher, and the other was that the costs are basically um, a wash. So um, we have another microphone there if, if either of you want to. So for the former about uh, retrofits costing more without doing envelope work, that's strictly for retrofits of existing buildings. Often in gut renovations, uh, it triggers code uh, in needing to upgrade the insulation anyways to the same level as with, as with new construction. So like I live in a building that was gut renovated and the insulation is actually, is actually shockingly good for being maybe just a bit above code. So um, the, con the different distinction in what our examples were is that I was looking at just a single family home that has a greater proportion of energy for heating than for cooling. And so on a per unit of heating basis, a heat pump tends to, uh, an air source heat pump costs uh, about, you know, 20 to 30% more for heat. Ground source heat pump, it's, a, it's maybe a little bit lower than for gas. Uh, but on the cooling side, it is uh, cheaper than, than using a conventional system. And so Beverly's example was in a multi larger multifamily building where there's actually, over the course of the year, uh, these tighter multifamily buildings tend to have a lot more cooling needs than, than heating. And so that balance ends up like, it ends up evening out more uh, so that the, that gap is not as substantial as it is with a single family home. Yeah, and I, I wasn't clear, like, uh, if you do a gut rehab to the level that you guys are triggering this, you have to make envelope improvements. So it's not really relevant. I guess it's when we start looking at existing buildings and trying to electrify our homes as they exist right now, we should be aware, you, if you just electrified a triple decker that's very, very leaky right now, it would be much more expensive. But if you make the right envelope improvements, you're gonna get where the cost is not really that high. And um, See, oh, cooling dominated buildings. One of the big reasons is you have much more density. People actually generate a ton of body heat. And in really tight buildings, you know, you probably need a hair conditioner to, uh, a hair dryer to, to heat. You really don't need much heat. So just your TVs and the people in it makes it a cooling dominated building. And when we think 20 years out in the future, that's going to be even more true. So great. Thank you. I saw a hand in the back over there. Um, I'm happy to give my thoughts on this, and I'd welcome anyone else to give their thoughts. Um, but I, I have a couple of thoughts on this. The first one is that what you do when you do that is you basically um, are meaning that all of us are going to have to pay those costs down the line when we need to retrofit those buildings in 10, 20 years in order to, to reach these emission targets um, that we've set in order to avoid sort of catastrophic global warming. So um, I think that since, and it's very likely, I think, that um, you know, those retrofit costs are, costs are gonna be very expensive and they're gonna have to be shouldered by sort of um, us as a community rather than um, by individuals. And so I think sort of as sort of a, a community, it makes sense to try to um, prevent those higher future costs and we get the lower emissions um, sort of in the meantime. Um, I think the other one is, is um, 
I'm not 100% on this, I'd be, I'd be happy to hear input, but my understanding is that a lot of these buildings that are, are being built right now with gas for single residential homes, these are developers who have um, already sort of like a fairly, you know, standard um, house plan, you know, that includes gas. And so when they go and they build a new construction, they just use their standard plan, they're not sort of optimizing it every single time. Um, and so this is kind of a, a push to get them to um, adopt this technology that is already uh, practical. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add. Okay, I saw a question over here. Yeah, so um, the question was, uh, if for the waiver process that we're proposing, would the person uh, sort of in charge of that process have set criteria to determine that, or would it be left um, sort of entirely to their discretion? Um, do you want to talk about this, Ken? Uh, or Pat? The waiver process that we're considering is really based upon the one in Brookline, but the procedure is a little bit is a little bit different. Uh, the standard, however, the ultimate standard uh, is the same. Um, the waivers are available if the literal application of the bylaw would make the project financially infeasible or impractical to to implement. Um, there's also a direction, as there is in the Brookline uh, bylaw, that if this is only true for a part, uh, that the waiver extends to as little as possible. In other words, having one thing that would be uh, infeasible doesn't necessarily make a waiver for the entire project uh, infeasible. That would be a question to be done at any particular time. Now, it's clear that the way in which this will work in practice is that if we begin to see certain uh, factual patterns that produce waivable situations, the way in which the inspectional services normally operates is that they would recognize these and you would have a kind of a common law of waivers that would emerge. If something got so that it was clear that a certain kind of situation almost always required a waiver, uh, then I imagine that town meeting would address that uh, down the road. But remember that the purpose of the waiver procedure is not in general to let everything go through. The purpose of the waiver procedure is to allow those things to be considered in situations where we don't foresee them. We try to make exemptions clear and specific when we do see them. And so every waiver situation in some ways ultimately is and should be uh, something that is unique and that happens uh, in a particular factual circumstance that might not even happen in circumstances that look on the surface pretty similar to this one. So the answer is there'll be some kinds of criteria that will inevitably emerge as you take the basic criteria in the bylaw and begin to apply it. Sometimes that will ultimately lead either to a de facto or formal exemption so that you don't have to go through the motions of dealing with that each time. But at the end of the day, the question of financial impracticability is really essentially one that is different in each case. And the whole purpose of the waiver provision is to allow people who have a special case to make that case um, even though we did not foresee an exemption uh, that would apply in that, in that situation. So yes, there will be some kind of, of uh, becoming more precise uh, as we get more experience. We can't foresee everything, we know that. What the waiver provision is is essentially a, faith, a safety net. The general principle is clear and as we get more experience, the application will become more, more clear as well. I wonder if this specific example would, would help. Uh, as we said before, centralized domestic hot water systems are exempted, but they do have to meet a certain criteria to, to be exempted. So I'll just read the language to give you that feel. Piping required to produce po potable or domestic hot water from centralized hot water systems in buildings with building floor areas of at least 10,000 square feet, provided that the engineer of record certifies 
that no commercially available electric hot water heater exists that could meet the required hot water demand for less than 150% of installation or operational costs compared to a conventional fossil fuel hot water system. So for certain things that I think we're trying to get you know, to specifics to, um, to, guide, to guide the inspection. All right, question up here. So um, we have not talked to the electric utility, um, but we have certainly, this question has been raised before and we've looked into it. Um, so uh, the rough answer is, even if all communities across Massachusetts adopted this sort of bylaw, um, as we saw, this would affect, you know, less than 1% of all the buildings in Arlington. So um, this would affect sort of less than 1% of all the buildings uh, in the state in any given year. And year-to-year -year variability um, in sort of demand of the grid is around 1%. Um, so the effect that this would have would be um, kind of like noise. Um, but I think the other thing to add is that um, the electric grid system, <laughs> the, the electrical grid uh, in Massachusetts and in all the state, all of the cold climate states uh, in the Northeast is, is summer peak dominated. Um, the difference between the peak demand that's needed by uh, the system uh, in uh, in you know that peak day in July and in January is almost two is is I think a gap of about thirty to forty percent. And so getting to that point, I think with adding you know 0.4, 0.5 percent of um, you know total square footage every year with buildings that actually all also have central cooling because you know that's also going to be increasing the the need um, on you know on the summer peaking side without additional efficiency. There's still a lot of room in between that in terms of uh, um, you know the amount of room in the winter, which is when I think you'll see most of this demand. Yes, in the longer term, when we look at every at all existing buildings, there definitely is some sort of con some concern. It makes the importance of efficiency uh, in in existing buildings more important, and also thinking about other technologies that can allow for um, coordination with the grid, as well as you know thinking about you know not just air source, but also you know options like like uh, ground source, which is more efficient on the peak days, uh, and other supplemental technologies that can be valuable. But um, certainly from new construction alone, there's not really a concern about what that's going to do to uh, the current, current demand on the grid. So, so if, we, if we pass this, the lights aren't going to go out? No. <laughs> We we did we did we actually we had a similar conversation uh, through the HeatSmart program since we were uh, the t neighboring town of Belmont, uh, which is you know a municipal utility. Uh, they had asked the question because uh, Belmont's town meeting also voted to uh, take to take electrification of fossil fuels um, as their primary pathway uh, for for meeting their town's uh, climate targets. And, and when we looked at you know what was the gap in between uh, the summer peak and the winter peak in the town of Belmont, it was about twofold. Uh, was the with, with the difference, and so there was a lot of room in that in that in that gap. You know, it was, it was uh, um, assuming no changes to the insulation or anything of the buildings. If we were just looking at the existing buildings, you could get you know uh, about 15 to 20 percent of those buildings fully electrified before you started having any issues with uh, with the mismatch there. And that's assuming no efficiency improvements and not counting new construction where uh, the balance is a little bit different. And I'll add one more quick thought to that um, while we're sort of on the topic. In the winter, um, rather than sort of peak demand being an issue, one of the issues is um, constraint, uh, constrained natural gas supply, and that drives up prices. And so because heat pumps are so efficient, um, even with electricity generated from natural gas, um, they'll end up using less natural gas. So this slightly helps um, that issue. Uh, yes?
Um, the state, uh, well, Brookline's bylaw is under review by the uh, state attorney general's office right now, and so that will obviously have an impact on any of the other towns that are discussing this, this sort of uh, uh, local ordinance. Uh, the state is in the process of starting a net zero uh, building code uh, implementation within the stretch code, which could ultimately supersede, supersede this, or depending on how they decide to define net zero, there is a lot of different ways to do so, um, could end up, um, you know, you could end up you know effectively leading to not being able to install fossil fuel appliances in buildings anyways to meet the code requirements. So that process is ongoing right now. Um, other cities, uh, city of Boston is in the middle of looking at a um, you know a net zero zoning uh, ordinance. Um, so there's a lot of these conversations are happening in parallel, both in neighboring neighboring towns and you know Cambridge is having those conversations. I, um, you know, so there, there's a lot. There are a lot of municipalities that are looking to uh, have these conversations first, and but at the same time, uh, the state is actually continuing to move in that direction with each uh, subsequent uh, revision of the building code and then the stretch code, uh, getting closer to requiring net zero in all new construction. So that will essentially get us to that point. You know by by requirement of the performance of the standard without needing to be prescriptive about the the uh, the, the fossil fuels themselves and if I can add um, a couple of thoughts to that um, so the state also has its own sort of statewide emissions targets, 80% um, reductions by 2050, and I think it's very likely that we'll commit to sort of net zero by 2050 um, this year. And meeting those targets, even the 80% by 2050, um, is not really possible with large scale use of fossil fuels for home heating. So the state is going to have to do something at some point. Um, and I think, you know, this is something we can do on a municipal level that can help sort of um, push the bar uh, on the state level. Um, and as far as other communities that are considering this, um, I'm not 100% sure how, how far different communities are in really getting this done this year. Um, but ones that I've heard um, sort of considering it um, are Lexington, Belmont, Cambridge, Somerville, Newton, um, Medfield, um, Concord. Concord, I want to, Wellesley, um, I want to say Reading or maybe one of the towns around there. Um, just a few off the top of my head, so I think there there is uh, sort of momentum there. And Pat, do you want to add something? It seems to me that that it's pretty clear that the thrust of this ordinance or of this bylaw is, is similar to the thrust of state policy. And I just wanted to comment for a moment on the on the what's before the attorney general. Um, basically, ultimately, every bylaw that is passed by uh, uh, town uh, meeting needs to be reviewed by the attorney general, and that was true of Brookline's, or Brookline's by bylaw as well. Um, that proceeding is ongoing. Uh, it will take considerable time. This is probably the biggest uh, of review of this kind that has happened in a long time in that office. Uh, it usually isn't quite this controversial, even though, of course, it's not controversial among town meeting members. Um, and so we're probably not going to find out until midsummer, maybe a little bit later. Uh, that's beyond a statutory deadline, but that is normally uh, waived. And so we are likely to find out well after our own town meeting, uh, but possibly before the town meetings of some of the other communities who are, are looking at this. Um, the Brookline's position is the issue there is strictly a question of law. It's a question of whether the town has the power to do what it is that it is, uh, it is trying to do. Um, the, it's clear that in general the town has the power to enact bylaws in order to, uh, in order to protect the public health, which is what this is aimed to do. Um, the difficulty uh, is whether or not uh, it violates any area, or it, it intrudes on any area that has been occupied by state law. And predictably, the, the gas utilities say that it has, and Brookline says that it hasn't. Throughout all of the process, and Jesse can, I'm sure, say, expand on, expand on this in some detail, great effort has been made to not make this a building code matter which would raise a question of preemption, uh, and also to make this not a question of uh, trying to regulate gas. Uh, it, because utility regulation, including for safety, is also something that is committed to state law. 
That's why it is that it only applies inside the gas meter, so it's not utility regulation. And you can see by its very nature, it is not a building code -ish sort of thing. It's not aimed to build safe buildings and that sort of thing. It's really aimed at achieving a further object objective in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of protecting public health and ultimately protecting the planet against the degradation of the atmosphere and the ecosystem on which we all depend. That certainly doesn't sound like a building code sort of issue to me. Nobody knows for sure what the Attorney General is going to decide. Uh, the question for us, for me at least, is are we going to let the momentum for all of this die away and why we all tread water waiting for a legal uh, determination by the Attorney General? And then what? Uh, and it seems to me that, that Arlington can serve a very useful purpose in keeping, even if ultimately the Brookline Ordinance is, is overturned in some way, because it doesn't necessarily have to be overturned completely. It could be some part of it uh, is, is not. We at least can keep, keep going and keep the issue alive, and I think we are likely to have a defensible ordinance. If we don't, we will figure out what to do with it then. Uh, but in the meantime, what happens when you, uh, when you stop is the same thing that happened to the, to the bunny in the, in the, in the fable. Uh, when, you, when you stop for a while, you, be, you begin to lose the race, and that is what we're trying not to do. This is Jesse Gray from Brookline. I just wanted to add a, a political comment uh, in answer to this question. So answering this question politically of where does the state fit in with local communities? And the, the fact of the matter is we're not moving fast enough to solve this problem. We are facing a problem that uh, we as a, a human species has never faced before, a global problem of immense complexity. And our political institutions are ill-suited to solving this problem and have demonstrably failed to solve it um, over the past several decades. And so the question is, um, how, do we, how do we proceed? How do we move forward? And how do we actually solve the problem? And it's not a technological problem. It's a political problem. The solutions are political, not technological. The, largely, the technological solutions are ready. There's some exceptions, like uh, long-haul aviation. But uh, for the most part, this is a political problem. And um, the will to solve this problem is concentrated in our cities and in our towns. It's concentrated in urban areas. And so um, we have more will in our local urban communities to solve this problem than we have in the state uh, legislature and than we have at the state level in general. And we are not moving fast enough at the state level and the federal level. And actually, it's, it's so many of us um, fixate in, on, the, on the presidential election or on uh, gubernatorial elections. But what may be more important for climate is what we do right here at home, where we have the political will and what we just need to do is figure out how to use it. This, I think, is a great example of how we can exercise that will. Um, and we can keep exploring and finding new ways to exercise it. And so towns and cities ought to exercise the powers they have and find new ones wherever they can um, to solve this immense problem in front of us. And once local communities start, uh, states and countries will follow. So it wasn't, it wasn't described tonight the, the sort of recent history of this movement, which started in Berkeley, California um, in July. It was only in July of 2019 that Berkeley, California passed the first prohibition on new fossil fuel infrastructure anywhere in the country. And by now, we're up to almost 30 California communities that have copied uh, Berkeley, uh, plus Brookline, plus a recent announcement. I don't know if you saw New York City plans to do this. Um, and so um, it is not an accident that local communities are leading the way, uh, but states will eventually follow um, if, we, if we show them the way. Yeah. 
yet our governor gave it a, a green go-ahead. So all legal means thus far have ended, which is why I got arrested there last week doing nonviolent direct action. But lots more of us need to combine if we really want to stop gas infrastructure from growing. We need to look at all of the elements. This is, this is so fabulous. I'm so proud of all of you all to bring this to town. And I just want to mention that there are other things we can do, too, to support cracks, the Four River residents against the gas compressor. Um, it's not going to help Massachusetts, but it's on contaminated soil in an industrial area. We've had explosions already in Lawrence and North Andover. This would be so much worse. It's next to a couple of power plants and propane tanks, and I can't imagine the worst place. But these are the kinds of things that we're all up against, and we need to think locally, and we need to think regionally, and look at the many, many ways that gas companies are trying to keep their growth many ways that communities all along the way, and for this pipeline there are many communities that are trying to stop it and are interfering, and that's something that we have the opportunity to participate in. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So um, the idea with waivers is if you can show that um, you know, there's not really a, a practical, affordable option out there, um, then you can apply for and potentially get the waiver. So if for in those cases there is not sort of a, a practical um, non-fossil fuel uh, alternative, um, then you can certainly apply for a waiver. I don't think we can say ahead of time um, exactly what is going to end up being waived or not. So that's all, if someone took a house with us with regulatory heating in, and the only practical way to do that is with fossil fuel, and they don't get a waiver, then they can't do it. Good. Geothermal is a fantastic technology for radiant floor heating, actually, because the lower temperature means that you can maximize the efficiency of that. So that's actually one of the best applications for ground source heat pumps and new construction is radiant floor heating. It, it's you only you to be able to you know for a house that's about two thousand square feet you need about um, an area that's about I don't know forty by forty by forty to you know thirty to, you know you can spread that out over in different areas but you only need you know each borehole only needs to be about fifteen feet from the foundation it can be even can potentially be closer in a new construction project and only needs to be separated from each from by by twenty feet and you need um, you'd only need two of those for a new building. We're not, you know, they're not talking about, you know, a lot of, a lot of geothermal projects are, you know, a lot of trenching and, 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 you know, we're talking about drilling boreholes about yay wide that need to be 20 feet apart. And there's also air to water heat pumps, which are used a lot in Europe. So there they have design temperatures for hot water systems that are lower than our design temps and radiant flooring is perfect for that temperature. So there's a lot of other options too. Any other questions? Yes. So I think the question is, what about the comfort level of heating with an air source heat pump rather than, say, um, hot water baseboard heating? I don't know. Jeremy might be able to answer this better. But I guess um, in new construction, you have a ton of options for what these look like and how they feel to you. So I would say it's very easy to duct an air source heat pump 
and it would be very similar to what you're used to for, it would look like a furnace grill, right, that comes out, and the air would be coming the same way. Um, one nice thing about air source coupons is they're easier to zone. So uh, you don't have to have the same temperature everywhere. You've got different uh, areas that you can have cooler or warmer, depending on how much you use those rooms. So in some ways, people will argue air source coupons are better for comfort in some ways. Again, new construction is going to have a great envelope, and so you're really not going to need a ton of heating and cooling in that envelope. It's sort of different when you're talking about retrofitting. If you don't do any improvements and you have a really leaky house and you try and use all, all air source heat pumps, you're going to probably not be that comfortable. Virtually every new residential building that's being built right now is being built with forced hot air uh, furnaces, uh, boilers. Uh, are fairly uncommon uh, in small residential new construction just because um, everybody wants air conditioning now and so you need to have uh, forced, forced air ductwork to be able to provide central AC. So your comparison may not necessarily be, you know, a hot water baseboard in an older home now, but a, but a, but a furnace and a central AC system uh, in a newer home. Um, a lot of people don't like forced hot air. Uh, my, my complaint of it, I have it, you know, I, the place that I live in came with a new high efficiency furnace. It's that on a day when it was, last winter when we had that day, it was like negative two, negative three. The, bur the furnace ran for five hours out of a 24 hour period. It went, it blasted for a while, heated up the space and then went, and went down. The temperature, temperature just dipped and kind of went up and down and up and down. Um, one of the things about a, a cold climate heat pump, this applies to ground source heat pumps as well, is that they're, uh, to be able to be certified as a cold climate heat pump, it needs to be what's called variable speed. And so it needs to be able to go up and down uh, in terms of temperature. So instead of having, you know, blasts of heat uh, as you would with a furnace or a central air conditioner, you have a system that's, you know, putting out, is running more continuously but at a more consistent temperature. So generally uh, when, when a lot of, uh, um, you know, dockless mini splits in particular have been, mo have been monitored, uh, there was a study on this done by, uh, through uh, the DOE funded Building America project, they found, uh, found generally more uh, stable air temperatures uh, throughout throughout the year um, in in bu in buildings that were zoned with mini splits. So you know comfort is comfort is personal, but uh, but generally you know one of the thing that I that I would like about them is is a little bit more consistency in terms of air temperature. And there's a lot of folks in the in the room here that I know have heat pumps as well. So certainly feel free to ask them. Yeah, um, <laughs> completely non scientific answer. I recently redid my own house. Um, so it's, it's a renovation, but not a complete gut. Some weatherization, I have radiant floors with natural gas on my first floor, three s mini splits on, on the second floor. And I do find that, um, well, thank you. I do find that the uh, comfort level on the second floor with the heat pumps is great. And, and to Jeremy's point, that sort of consistent heating level as opposed to those spikes is really nice. You don't get that, that really hot blast, um, again, it, to, uh, to Jeremy's point, all, other point, it is all personal, but uh, you know, uh, on, on some pretty cold days, uh, I found that uh, I find that they, they work very nicely. Great, go ahead. coming up from the ground from the hundred year old uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, town wide funding cap for, to distribute this stuff. Uh, uh, so, um, what is the track record?
So the question was, um, how does sort of the longevity and reliability of these systems compare to, say, um, sort of a natural gas system, and especially uh, for a ground source heat pump where you have to dig expensive holes and that sort of thing? Yeah, so uh, I, I, you know, I know a lot of folks will point to, you know, if I've got this boiler in the, in the basement, it's been there since 1960, and, you know, it, it still puts out heat. Um, as with everything else that we buy these days, nothing lasts as long as it used to, um, like it or not. You know, the days of you know 50-year-old cast iron boilers is, is pretty is pretty much past us. Um, the Massachusetts utilities, um, so some that that you know folks that you know amortize these costs over 50 plus years, they rate the typical boiler uh, in installed in you know natural gas boiler installed in Mass today at 20 years. Typical furnace at I believe I, it's somewhere between 15 and 17 years. Typical air conditioner at 15 years. The typical air source heat pump at between 15 and 18 years. They don't have one for, for ground source heat pumps, but typically we, we, we've seen, we've uh, a lot of uh, estimates have put them at 20 to 25 years for the indoor equipment. The outdoor equipment, um, uh, there are some manufacturers that will offer a no leak warranty of 55 years. On the on the on the on the piping, the piping, you know, we're t we're talking about you know issues with you know old you know old uh, steel or some cases iron or even you know I, I've heard reports that there's there's old wood gas piping somewhere in the state, uh, but uh, you know most most of the um, uh, ground loops that are being installed uh, for ground source heat pumps are high density polyethylene, which has which uh, is rated at a lifetime of about a hundred years, uh, so. Um, and some of and you know the heat fusion that's used to join them actually uh, typically increases their strength as well. So um, not also not as concerned there because those those systems are really circulating uh, primarily water with a bit of uh, propylene glycol in them, not circulating something that's going to explode, um, not circulating uh, generally not in, in the, these days not circulating refrigerant or toxin. So. If those do leak, you know, after 50 or more years, uh, they're, you know, in, in the same way that we have to replace gas pipes every, every, you know, every several decades, um, it's in, it's a sim in a similar state. Um, Eversource right now uh, recently proposed in its most recent uh, rate case uh, to begin installing uh, in pilot projects uh, community ground source uh, heat pump loops in lieu of their gas infrastructure uh, to explore what that what those implications would be. As part of their long, you know, long-term business model. So, um, you know, I, I look look to some of the more, I guess, the uh, the more long, you know, the institutions that have to be along, around for a long time and are tend to be more conservative about these sorts of estimates around, you know, what they think, how long they think these will last. Uh, the last thing I'll say also is that an air source heat pump, when you buy off the street today, has a 12-year warranty on the parts and the compressor. Uh, the compressor being the biggest thing that can. Uh, fail and be problematic. So, you know, there, there's the, um, you asked as well sort of in the, you know, comparing, comparing different markets, you know, air source heat pumps uh, and that, you know, ductless uh, heat pump technology in particular is not, it accounts for 90% of buildings in East Asia and has since the 70s. So uh, there's, a, there's an extensive track record. Uh, in Germany this year, um, past year, more heat pumps were sold than fossil fuel equipment. Uh, so it, it's, it definitely has, um, it may be relatively newer in the Northeast, but definitely not in the rest of the world. And just, just to turn the question around a little bit, um, we talk about you know, the, the net zero by uh, 2050, right? That's 30 years from now. We're talking about assets that last something like 20 years. So you, we need to be thinking about making those changes now because you know, you, you, if you're if you're looking at oh, I'm going to put in a new system, right? Where's that going to be? You know, how how are we going to get to 2050 uh, if we're not making those 20, 30 year investments now? Because 2050 is around the corner. So the question is, uh, why in Europe is there equipment available that can do heat pump hot water for larger buildings, um, but that's not available here? Um, Georgia, do you want to talk about it or Jeremy? Uh, you go first this time. <laughs> um, I think 
a lot of it has to do with our fuel prices. Yeah. So uh, technology has been around a long time, but the manufacturers of it don't find that there's, or didn't think that there's enough of a market here because fuel is too cheap. And an, yeah, another component to that is there, there are central heat pump water heaters that are available. They're just not common in the U.S., in, in the Northeast market, uh, even within the U.S. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the main challenges is simply, uh, you know, the cold climate systems that were brought into the, into the U.S. market that essentially started kicking things off about seven, seven years ago, um, a, lot, you know, a lot of that technology was brought in from the East Asian market by manufacturers like, you know, like Mitsubishi, uh, Daikin, et cetera. Um, the challenge is that in bringing in a product from overseas into the U.S. market, it costs millions of dollars to get everything certified. And so, you know, like it or not, there's a business incentive behind whether a manufacturer chooses to bring a product from a different market into the U.S. market. One of the things that a lot of manufacturers observed was that um, actually under federal regulations, if you install an electric water heater uh, over 55 gallons, it has to be a heat pump water heater. The problem is, is that they didn't include it for under 55 gallons. So when so GE actually put millions of dollars in investments into a new plant uh, for for this product line, uh, they found that the regulation was easily subverted by if somebody needed 80 gallons of hot water, they just put in two electric, two 40 gallon electric tanks. Regulation regulation averted. So the initial the the um, projected market that they were expecting met about five percent of their sales. So a lot of manufacturers are very wary of bringing that technology into the U.S. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of you know systems that are available just because Europe in general doesn't have a lot of doesn't have a lot of AC in homes. You know, the the temperature of the water being used in heating is different. Um, you know, it takes it takes sort of a specific case to bring a new product uh, to market from overseas. And you said you had a comment. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Yes. Um, I'll comment on the historic district part, um, which is that we've talked to several people who live in historic districts who um, have been able to have heat pumps installed. Um, they might be required to sort of put them in the back of the house or, or not have them be sort of visible from the street. Um, but otherwise, there have not seemed to be any barriers to um, at least heat pump technology in historic districts. That's an excellent question. I think in terms of, in general, using heat pumps and finding ways of using them in places which are not, that don't necessarily lend themselves and there's a problem to solve. It probably isn't a problem with this legislation because the legislation only applies to new construction, so that doesn't apply. And it also only applies to gut renovations. And I think that you're not going to see very many gut renovations allowed in a historic district. So the general problem that we've been talking about, about heat pump, is absolutely relevant and a good question and something that needs to be followed up. But it's not a, a question that's really decisive for, if, for this bylaw at this point.
Okay, okay. But, you know, I'm just saying that, I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't say that it never could happen because you can show me that it can happen, but it's highly unlikely uh, to, to happen. And uh, when it does, I mean, there, are, there is a process for dealing with that. That is, a, that is a situation in which it is possible that the waiver provisions would come into place precisely to a point I made earlier because it's such an unexpected sort of thing that you have to consider each of these facts on each of these cases on their own facts. Yes. What I'm thinking of is for a person who owns that type of house who wants to put in, uh, you know, they have tons of money, <laughs> the ground floor is deep pump. We're not one of those, we're not those people. So if you put in, if you go to the expense and you put in mini splits, but then to do a proper, and I only recently heard about air sealing, um, to do a proper envelope, whatever it is you do to it, um, that's then an additional cost for people with historic homes. To put in proper windows that don't leak, we have very leaky windows, that's an additional cost on top of that. So we live in a 1927 historic home that was not built for rich people, we're in R4, right. but we're expected to meet standards of homes in R1. Okay. Yeah, so um, that particular case is totally unaffected by this bylaw, um, unless you're ripping the entire sort of house apart and doing a gut rehab, in which case these costs are not necessarily added costs because you have to pay them anyways to be up to code. Um, in your particular case, I think um, if Jeremy might be willing to, to stay for a few minutes and talk to you afterwards, um, he was a part of the recent sort of uh, heat smart um, program here in Arlington where um, you know, we addressed a lot of these uh, sort of issues and concerns from a lot of different people, so I'd recommend um, connecting afterwards. So I, I recommend uh, connecting with, with experienced people offline. I just want to see if there are any more questions um, related to sort of the, the bylaw specifically. Um, if not, we can certainly end early. Oh, yes. Um, so this is sort of the, the real um, sort of groundwork is done by um, the building inspector, um, basically who does not issue a permit unless you comply with this bylaw. Um, and that's also the person who's sort of dealing with the waiver process and assessing that sort of thing. One more thing. So one other question I've heard other places when this kind of thing is brought up um, is what happens if the power goes out for two days? Well your gas system or your oil system will not work either. So you're in the same situation and that's all the more reason that the envelope is really important because you'll be able to stay longer. So like passive house new construction, four days you can stay in it without the temperature dropping so low that people have to move out. So in affordable housing, that's really important, right? Because they don't have this often the same social networks that we do to go to family who's not in the outage area. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so um, the question is if there's like a disagreement in, in the waiver process or other sorts of things. My understanding is that it would go to um, appeals, like an, it, it would be an appeal essentially and would follow the appeal process, which is going to the Zoning Board of Appeals, which handles all sorts of sort of building related appeals issues. Um, and they basically make a ruling and then that ruling can be challenged in court and it's like eventually at the end of the day, the courts decide. 
um, as with most things. Yes, we spoke to, um, what were their exact titles? So, so the, the main building inspector um, was sort of on administrative leave uh, up, up until recently, um, but instead we spoke to... No, it wasn't building inspector. Oh, building, okay. It was but, the gas, also the gas okay, so, so we spoke to the building inspector and the gas inspector. Um, they seemed on board, said it was doable. Um, we had a good discussion. They didn't bring up any major concerns. Let me just emphasize that this that Brookline did a fabulous job with this with this the way in which they've done their statute uh, because it was they worked it out with their building inspector as well and the concepts that are that are incorporated especially in how you define what a major renovation is uh, is something that was carefully worked out in order to be administrable to have as little deviation from well understood concepts of uh, that are applicable in other areas of law as well. So when we were showing it to Mr. Champa, he was seeing things for the most part, not completely, but seeing things that he'd seen before. And that's also one of the reasons the appeals process would probably work going to the board, the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals on which I sit. Uh, and that is that, that the kinds of appeals, when you look at how you define what a major renovation is or what new construction is, and how you define the uh, exemptions, those are almost never based upon uh, something that involves an economist and an analysis of costs. The question, if, if it's a building of a certain size and you have a certain certificate, then you get the exemption for hot water because that's the way it's written in. So the kinds of decisions that the building inspector is making is, is similar, except with waivers, is similar to the kinds of decision he makes already. And the same thing is true with the appellate process, which already exists. It's the same kinds of appeals that the Zoning Board of Appeals already, already see. So the waiver process is the only thing that is outside that framework. That is a little bit different, and that those kinds of things it's envisioned will be done with the assistance of other town staff, and potentially, if necessary, in a really in a important and, and uh, novel case, uh, potentially outside uh, outside assistance. But you know, when you're talking about a total of maybe 70 cases a year, the number of times that's going to come up is going to be pretty small. That's a great question. Uh, so the question was sort of how, what are the next steps for us and what are ways that people can sort of um, get involved and move this forward? So um, the most immediate next step is that we have a hearing in front of the select board that's scheduled for the evening of March 9th. Um, so we'll do probably a similar kind of presentation and then um, I, I believe they have sort of an open forum for citizens to talk and that sort of thing. So um, showing support at that hearing is definitely um, something that's helpful. Um, but then, you know, the, the big, the, the rubber beats the road at town meeting, which starts April 27th. Um, so we're sort of organizing, um, we, we're having volunteers who are acting as kind of precinct captains who will sort of manage being in touch with all the town meeting members and we're trying to reach out to um, every single town meeting member, provide them sort of basic information and sort of answer any questions or concerns that they have because um, hopefully as you've seen, um, there is a lot of sort of initial uh, concern that people have, but once you start getting sort of the facts um, and sort of the, the reality of it, it tends to be pretty non-controversial. Non so our goal is really to reach out to people. Um, so we have a couple of um, spots there for precinct captains, depending on what precinct you're in. Um, to anyone who's interested in kind of learning more or, or getting involved in general, we have a website, um, Clean Heat for Arlington, MA. Um, four is spelled out, F-O-R, not the number four. Um, so you can go there, we have a contact form, um, we have a little bit of information up there, we're starting to get more information up there. That's a great way to um, sort of get in touch with us and get involved. Um, in general, we always need more people to help, um, you know, we're also trying to coordinate meetings with all sorts of stakeholders and people in the business communities, that sort of thing. 
Um, and then the final thing I say is just, you know, talk to people. If you know any town meeting members, if you know your neighbors, educate them. Um, a big part of this is just there are so many misconceptions and misunderstandings about heat pumps um, that we just kind of need to get the word out here, out there that, you know, it's practical, it's the right thing to do, we can do this now. Yeah, you want to add one more thing? See, if you'd only seen the, uh, the script for this, that was supposed to be my line. Uh, I waited through this entire hearing, and then Amos st stole my thunder in, in the conclusion. And I, didn't, I only got the three sentences earlier, so I'm feeling. <laughs> but there's one thing that I know that, that Amos doesn't really know in the same way, because I'm a town meeting member, and I've been involved in uh, working for working on setting up uh, precinct meetings that are that we had last fall uh, and that we will have again in April um, and I should say that that the person who is really whoa the person who is really in charge of, of setting all of that up is mr. Diggins who was asking questions a little bit earlier and who has done a remarkable job through Envision Arlington in trying to organize precinct meetings so that town meeting members can talk to each other, which they previously weren't doing so much, but, but more importantly, so that you can talk with them and they can talk with you. So you'll see notices will come out. They'll be posted in Kickstand, where I assume all of you spend at least an hour a day. <laughs> and the, 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 town, uh, the town notices will all give addresses for each of the meetings. The, some, of the, some of the precincts tend to meet together. Uh, in mine, one, three, and five tend to meet together at the Thompson School because everybody votes there. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Go to those meetings and say what you think. Uh, and I'm sure your town meeting members would like to hear that. Yeah. So is part of the reason that new high school will have Hi, Ken Pruitt, the town's energy manager, and the question was, uh, why did the town choose um, ground source heat pumps for the new high school, and um, were there any uh, incentive payments uh, from the state or utilities that helped made that possible? So the high school is actually all electric, uh, no fossil fuel combustion whatsoever. It's a combination of ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps. Um, I think there's 130 ground source heat pumps planned and the rest of the building is going to be handled uh, strictly through air source heat pumps. Um, and um, we did uh, get actually quite substantial financial benefit from doing this. Uh, we enrolled in a, a utility program called Accelerate Performance. And so we're essentially getting a minimum of a $200,000 uh, payment for achieving the low level of energy usage that we achieved. And then going forward, um, there's a, a, an alternative energy credit program uh, where we can actually uh, get uh, regular payments over, uh, it's either 10 to, 20, 10 to 20 years, I think it might be 10 years, um, because of our generation of um, energy from, um, from the heat pumps. So there was, but uh, in addition to that, um, the, the energy savings that we're achieving are, are really the bigger story. Uh, the, the high school is gonna be using less than half of the energy per square foot um, than the current uh, high school is using. And so the, the cost savings over the lifetime of the building actually dwarf any of the utility incentives that we're getting. Um, so the question is sort of when does this really go into effect and start changing things? Um, our current, the current date that we have on the bylaw for this to, to begin implementation would be um, July 1st, 2021. So not this July, but the next year. 
Um, and the idea there is um, we may not hear back from the Attorney General until July this year of the ruling there. Um, and then so we want to have sort of a significant amount of lead time to really a big part of that is just going to be educating developers to make them know ahead of time that this is going into effect and so that they can sort of prepare for it um, and, and be ready to go. Um, Brookline's uh, effective implementation date is January 1st, 2021. So that's sort of the soonest that this would go into effect there. Um, although there are some caveats to that. So um, my understanding there is um, it's, there's not really an impact from changing your um, sort of home heating system because there's already sort of fairly stringent regulations on sort of ventilation of those systems to the outside, that sort of thing. Um, that's mainly a factor for cooking with gas at home. Um, cooking with gas actually does, does lead to um, sort of unhealthy levels of various um, pollutants inside of your home that you're then living and breathing in and can lead to asthma in, in, in young children and has been connected to asthma in sort of lower income communities, that sort of thing. Um, but in this case, since all cooking appliances are exempted, um, there's no kind of effect there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I could just add that, you know, when you're thinking about building a new, a new home, and if you're prohibited from installing gas heat and gas hot water, um, then you are going to be faced with a, a very different kind of decision than you're faced with now. Uh, and that decision is, you know, are you going to install gas cooking equipment in the kitchen, you know, a gas range or gas cooktop, if um, that would then um, require you to get a gas hookup and to put uh, significant gas piping through your home? And um, one of the reasons that the, a lot of homes in the South are all electric is just the cost of installing um, the, all of that piping. And so um, the calculus becomes much different, and we hope that it will become much less likely that uh, gas cooking equipment will be installed um, a, a under this type of a, a policy. But of course, it's, it's still, still allowed. Yeah. It's um, pretty much nine o'clock, so unless anyone has any last minute things, we will close. I guess if you wanna come up, Pat. Pat's already said his bits, so yeah, feel free to get in touch, and thank you all very much for coming tonight.